So, good morning, everybody. Um, uh, my name is Theo Javé. I'm working in Basel in the laboratory of Eric van Limbegen. And uh, today I will talk to you about my PhD work that consisted in studying uh, the response of E. coli to carbon starvation at the senior cell level. So what happens when we put uh, bacteria in a flask of fresh nutrient? Well, it's been well established, and we have seen a couple of examples of that last week, that bacteria will start growing exponentially, consuming the nutrients. And once those nutrients are exhausted, they will reach what is called the stationary phase, where the number is stagnating. And if we leave them long enough in this phase, they will start uh, dying. And um, as we've seen last week, most of what we know quantitatively about bacterial gene expression has actually been established on exponentially growing cells. And arguably one of the reasons for that is that it's very easy uh, in exponential growth to put the cells in a reproducible steady state. But if you think of it, and we have uh, had a glimpse of that uh, in the talk right now, in most environments, nutrients are limited. So we actually expect bacteria to spend at least a substantial part of their lifetime in a state of starvation for some nutrient. We also expect that the selective pressure associated with starvation have therefore shaped the evolutionary history of bacteria. And it's fundamental for understanding it to understand what's happening during uh, starvation. Stationary phase is in the lab a proxy for uh, this state of starvation because the cells stop growing due to the uh, exhaustion of the nutrients, as I was just explaining. Given the fact that the bacteria seems not to be active and seems to not change their numbers, we can ask, okay, can bacteria do anything at all in starvation or are they simply dormant and waiting for new nutrients to come in order to regrow? Well, in 2014, it's been shown by Geffen and colleagues that uh, bacteria are actually able to sustain gene expression during starvation. To do so, they use genetically modified E. coli, carrying a transcriptional reporter where a promoter of interest is driving the expression of a fluorescent protein. By following the fluorescent signal emitted by the cell, they were able to follow the ability of the cells to express genes. So they put those bacteria in a flask of fresh nutrient, as I explained before, let them grow exponentially into the rich stationary phase. They ask, what is the production rate of the fluorescent protein in a long time? And they could see that, as expected, as bacteria enter stationary phase, this production rate is dropping massively due to the exhaustion of energy. But the surprising result is that instead of dropping to zero, this production rate was dropping to about 10% of this exponential phase value and remain relatively stable for an extended period of time. The authors call this constant activity in stationary phase. And this really signals the fact that bacteria are not dormant uh, in stationary phase, but are able to keep on expressing genes, even though they are not growing anymore. Now, it's been reported many times that the concentration of various gene products in star cells is fundamentally different from exponentially growing ones. And this results in very different phenotypes of the exponentially growing cells compared to the star cells. Star cells are notoriously um, associated with, for example, relevant traits such as increased tolerance to a broad range of stresses, going from osmotic stresses to antibiotic, passing by oxidative stresses and phages. And it is therefore fundamental to try to understand what sets the concentration of the gene product to understand this phenotype inside the star, star cells. One fundamental difference between um, those cells and their exponentially growing counterpart is the fact that the turnover of protein is now greatly limited by the fact that the dilution stopped entirely because the cells are gross arrested. So we expect that star cells are not able to change the protein very efficiently. So the question we want to answer is actually what determines quantitatively the protein concentration inside the cells during starvation. Starvation is notoriously associated with um, heterogeneity. And so we want to under answer this question at the single cell level in order to understand how this variability um, can be characterized. To do that, we use a microfluidic device called the mother machine. We've seen a couple of examples of that last week, where individual bacteria that you can see as those black rods are growing into uh, dead end uh, growth channels that are those white lines. And we can feed them whatever nutrient we want through the main channel. In our experiment, we used about, like, in my uh, work, I uh, was studying about 20 uh, promoters of E. coli. And this was made possible by the fact that our microfluid chip, chip is multiplex, so we can study up to eight strains in parallel. And all of those strains are carrying a different transcriptional uh, reporter for a different promoter. 
Now, we use time-lapse fluorescent microscopy to gain, to obtain um, a long time, a time time resolution, images about the uh, phase contrast that will inform us about the morphology of the cell, their length typically, and images about the fluorescent, that is uh, an information about their gene expression. I don't have the time to enter into much details, but we use a sophisticated pre-analysis pipeline that allows us to recover uh, quantitative measurements uh, out of these uh, images. By that, I mean that we recover information about length and fluorescence inside individual cells where the measurement noise has been removed so that we have a very precise estimate of what is the actual length of the cell and the fluorescent content. On the top plot here, you can see uh, in um, example of individual cell traces in terms of fluorescence. And we also get a reliable estimate of instantaneous rate. Instantaneous rates are the instantaneous growth rate at the time of the measurement and uh, fluorescent production rate, so the volumic production rate, that is the amount of protein that is produced per unit time, per unit volume. And this last rate is a proxy for the activity of the promoter we are interested in. And you have an example of these, uh, of individual cell uh, traces of this rate on the lower plot here. In the stationary phase, the population is constant in that mono curve. Yes. Now, that could be because uh, every cell um, uh, is not growing. Yes. Or because, because cells are growing but also dying. Yes. The numbers, right? So your traces show cells to be growing. So uh, no, what about death? So this is... Um, uh, not in stationary phase. This is an exponential phase, sorry. Oh, this is an exponential yeah, phase. Yeah, because okay, basically, sorry. typically, what we do is we switch the cells from exponential growth to stationary phase, and I will come to that. But sorry, yeah, this is just an example of the way we treat our data, but this is exponentially growing cells. Yes, but so my first question is that in the stationary phase, is it that cells are growing and also dying? So, no. Uh, that's why the number is constant? Yes. Or is it that cells are not growing? So, cells are entering growth arrest. This is one of the results. Uh, within our um, time uh, frame, we observe no growth and no substantial death of the cells. Just wanted to add one thing. With E. coli, generally, once glucose runs out, for example, it takes one or two days before you start seeing variability going down. So, when you, st it takes like a long time before cells start actually dying. So within these time scales, yeah, I, I think it's just like cells not growing. Exactly. All right. So as I said, we want to study starvation uh, using this device. And what we typically do is we connect um, to the macrofluidic chip a media containing glucose, M9 plus 0.2% glucose, and a media containing no carbon sources, that is simply M9 not supplemented with any carbon source. Using a pressure controller and a feature of our um, uh, microfluidic device, we are able to switch very rapidly from M9 glucose, where the cells are growing exponentially, to M9 zero, where the cells will be starved for carbon. And what we observe is that the cells enter very quickly a gross arrest. So on this plot, you can see the uh, growth rate, and the average growth rate across the population is the black line, and it shows that the cells in general at time zero, where it's the moment of the switch are entering gross arrest. And you can see that individual cell traces um, that are shown as these thin uh, blue lines and the ribbon corresponding to the standard deviation across the mean shows that individual cells are also entering gross arrest. So there is an homogeneous gross arrest um, that is very abrupt at the moment of the switch. So now that I've shown you that we are able to follow individual cell and their gene expression a long time as we switch them from exponential growth to carbon starvation, I can come back to the question that we want to answer and show you what determines the protein concentration inside the cell during starvation. So we primarily follow the volumic production uh, rate that, uh, uh, that is a proxy for the uh, activity of the promoter we're interested in. And out of the 20 promoters that I studied, today I will show you only three of them um, that are covering the spectrum of behavior we observe for the, uh, all the promoters we studied in our uh, work. Um, on this plot, you can see the first example uh, for RPLN, that is a ribosomal promoter. And uh, on those plots, the thick, uh, colorful line corresponds to the average across the population, while, once again, the thin, colorful line corresponds to individual cell traces. 
Here I show the uh, volume free production rate normalized by its value in exponential phase, and I'm showing you 20 hours of starvation out of the typically 60 hours that we perform, simply because the, most of the dynamic is happening at the entry into starvation. In the case of promoters such as RPLN, the volumic production rate is sharply decreasing at the time zero, and then remain relatively stable around zero for the rest of the stationary phase. On the other end of the spectrum, sorry, we have promoters such as BOL A that is uh, controlled by RPOS. RPOS is an alternative sigma factor that is implicated in the response to starvation and stress. And as expected, for those promoters, we see um, an increased activity. But remarkably, this peak of activity at time zero is then followed by an exponential decrease of the um, uh, production uh, rate, so the promoter activity, towards zero. Finally, we have promoters such as HSLV, that is a heat shock promoter in this case, where we don't see an upregulation or a downregulation at the entry into starvation, but we simply see that the production rate is petering out. Now, since most of the dynamics seems to happen at the entry into starvation, we were wondering, okay, if we consider only simplified dynamic at the entry into starvation, are we able to predict what would be the concentration resulting from this production activity? And concentration is the interesting parameter here because uh, that's what will drive the phenotype of the cell ultimately. So we are wondering how those uh, differences of behavior are translating into differences of concentration. So here I'm showing, I will show you a very simple model where we consider the interplay between production, the simplified production dynamic, dilution, and degradation that are like coming together to lead to a certain concentration. In our experiments, the dilution is dropping to zero instantaneously, so we model it like that. The degradation we can measure experimentally for our fluorescent protein. I don't have the time to explain it here, but it's not going to be different for different promoters. So we really expect that actually the uh, difference will be led by the difference in terms of production activity. In the simplest case, that corresponds to uh, our ribosomal promoter case, the uh, production rate drops to zero at the same time as the dilution, so the promoter simply stops being active. And in this case, we expect the relative concentration to actually go down under the effect of the, start of the degradation. Now, simply introducing a gradual decrease, similar to what we've seen for the uh, promoters that peters out, this heat shock promoter, is enough to produce an expected increase into the relative concentration. And this is due to the fact that even though the dilution has stopped, the production keeps lingering on for a while, and therefore the concentration is expected to increase. Now, if we add a peak of production at the entry into starvation, such as we've seen for a ball hour or a dip, we modulate further the expected concentration. And so here, it's really fundamental to realize that it's the delay between the arrest of growth and of the production that shapes the concentration in the cells. And so, of course, yes, dilution stops, so that means the turnover of protein will be diminished. But the fact that the dilution stop also offers the cell the opportunity to change dramatically the concentration of certain gene product, even though there is no upregulation of the promoter. Now, when sorry, just to be yeah. sure. So, but in the previous plot, so I should expect that for longer time scales, of course, the, con the concentration should drop. So. Um, Given that the degradation rate in our, that we measure is exponentially decreasing, we actually expect that it sort of stabilizes. And also, like, yes, in this model, since the production drops to zero, you would uh, still expect that it sort of decreases, but like uh, at very long time scale. And because the degradation goes to zero. Yeah, I like case. sort of, yes, it exponentially decreases. So um, we basically use uh, inducible promoter. So we kick the, um, uh, the production of the, of the fluorescent protein. Then we let the cell enter in starvation and stop the induction of the protein. So they start with a certain pool. And then we measure very, uh, at very long time dynamic the fluorescence and see it decreasing. Really. So that we neglect the photobleaching effect because we measure very rarely and we are able to measure the level of the protein. Now when we look at our, to come back to our experimental data, uh, when we integrate the production um, a long time along with the concentration that we measure, the degradation that we measure experimentally, we indeed observe that the concentration of the, for the three different promoters is behaving as we expected for a more very simplistic model. So that really means that the, the dynamic at the entry into starvation is really important in setting those concentrations. 
And um, what we were surprised by is the fact that it seems that individual cells, like, uh, as can be seen by the standard deviation, like the ribbon around the uh, mean, seems to behave quite similarly and more similarly than to uh, in the other cases of uh, nutrient switches or something like that that we observe in the lab. So we wanted to quantify how homogeneous the cells are responding to starvation. And to do that, we, um, we can look at a metric that quantifies the amount of um, variance that is explained by the uh, fluctuation of the average behavior. So I will explain that with this cartoon. Um, on the top of the cartoon, you can see that we have individual cell traces that are those uh, thin lines. And all cells are considered acting independently. In this case, looking at the variance across all the observations, so across cell and time, we can see that it's much bigger than the variance of the um, average behavior across the population. On the contrary, if all cells are behaving exactly the same, we expect that the um, average behavior across the population recapitulates the, average, the behavior of individual cells. And the, var the fraction of the variance of the total observation that will be explained by the variance of the um, uh, population average will be big. Now, when we look at individual cell traces of concentration for our different promoters, in the case of RPLN, we see that B4 times zero, it looks like indeed the cells are uh, fluctuating a lot, crossing each other, and after we switch them to starvation, it looks more coherent. This is even more true for HSLV and BOL A, where we look at individual cell traces. It really looks like after we switch them to starvation, they respond very homogeneously, both in terms of timing and in terms of amplitude to starvation. And it seems that the, uh, most of the uh, viability or like most of the dynamic is most of the action is happening early on in starvation. So we want to ask, okay, how homogeneous is the response of the cells or how homogeneous is the behavior of the cell um, at different time points um, in our experiment? So we can divide um, the total span of our experiment into three different time windows. What's happening during the exponential growth? What's happening during the early starvation that we fix at 10 hours because uh, this is an arbitrary uh, threshold, but that is based on the fact that most of the changes we observe are happening early on. And what's happening during late starvation that are the remaining 50 hours of, um, of starvation. And when we look at this uh, fraction of explained variance, we see that uh, in all cases, the blue bar that corresponds to the transition is substantially higher than what's happening during growth and during late starvation. And this is particularly the case for HSLV and BOLA. So this really says that the, the cells, individual cells, are acting much more homogeneously during this transition than they would during growth or uh, during late starvation um, in terms of like this promoter activity. So this really sort of like shows that the, the response to this abrupt growth arrest is maybe a programmed response. Now, I've shown you that like, most of the dynamic is happening early on in starvation. But if you remember, one of the points I started with is um, that in the literature, there was some report of constant activity during starvation. So this means that we have to decipher, OK, what fraction of the phenotype of the cell is uh, dominated by sort of uh, basically what is the importance of this early production dynamic? And can we decipher whether this plays a big role in the, fact, uh, in the phenotype of the cell or whether the residual uh, promoter activity is actually dominating because over 50 hours of, uh, of residual activity, maybe it doesn't really matter that the cells have been very active at the entry into starvation. So once again, what we can do is divide our um, uh, time window into three different uh, time periods. What's happening during growth, what's happening during early starvation, and what's happening during late starvation in terms of production. And at every time point, we can ask, out of the pool, the total pool of protein present in the cell for a reporter during starvation, what fraction come from which production phase? So we expect that at time zero, the 100% uh, of the protein will come from what has been uh, coming from growth because we didn't start uh, considering pro production, that, um, production that is happening in uh, starvation. 
Until time 10 hours, we don't expect any green uh, to be visible because we consider early starvation to span from zero to 10 hours. And after 10 hours, we will start considering the uh, protein produced uh, in the late starvation, so the remaining 50 hours. So in the case of LPLN, you can see that uh, across time, the, uh, the red sector is largely dominating. And this is not surprising because the production drops almost instantaneously to zero. So the state of the cell at any time point in starvation is dominated by uh, what the cells have been inheriting from their exponential growth phase. Now, if we go from to our promoter that is petering out, you can see that the blue sector is taking over very quickly at the entry into starvation. So this means that the phenotype of the cell like that they had in uh, exponential growth is quickly forgotten and quickly replaced by a new phenotype that is set by the early production events. And after 60 hours of starvation, you see that the blue sector still dominates the fraction of the uh, protein. So it means that after 60 hours of starvation, the phenotype is still dominated by the early production events. And this is even more true when we look at promoters such as BOLA that display a peak, where here the blue sector at the end of the uh, starvation is largely dominated, uh, dominating the pool of protein. So this really tells us that the phenotypes of the cells are set early during starvation and are kept for a very long time. And so a way to interpret that is when cells are running out of food, they have a limited resources and limited time to act and change their phenotype. And they will do so very quickly. And after that, they will be set in the state they managed to reach for a very long time. But of course, the question that we can ask is, OK, does that matter at all for anything? And, um, and so like, if what we think uh, is correct, if the phenotypes are indeed really set early and that relevant traits are set early, we could ask, OK, what is the consequence of perturbing this gene expression on some relevant trait? And one of these relevant traits that I was mentioning in the introduction is the fact that uh, starved cells are globally more tolerant to a various range of stresses. So we decided to expose the cell to uh, an oxidative stress. Yes? Hey, hey Drew, is this uh, the, the plot that you just showed, how yes. much um, uh, production contributes to the protein pools? Can you say something about um, how much do you think like an active remodeling would, would contribute to the protein pools, you know, active degradation and then making proteins out of, um, yeah. So I, what we would uh, expect is, for example, if the cell were able to regrow, now if we, I would switch them back to exponential phase and ask the same question, I would expect that due to dilution, the turnover will be very quick and that like, the phenotype will be reset very quickly, right? But the thing is, uh, protein degradation has no chance to reach this amount of turnover because it consumes energy. Most of the um, uh, proteases in E. coli are ATP dependent. And uh, in the absence of carbon source, the, the cells are just unable to do it. So in the literature, there are some reports of active degradation at first. And we also observe that actually on our fluorescent protein. The degradation is uh, faster at the entry into starvation and then starts decreasing. Um, so it would increase the turnover and we would ex expect to have a, a faster uh, replacement, but, um, but practically we, uh, we don't think it's uh, really happening somehow. Uh, so if you, I mean, in your experiment, you, in order to induce the starvation, you just switch the media from uh, uh, glucose to nothing, basically, I mean, yes. to minimal medium. So uh, what's your intuition about uh, where do the cell take uh, the resources in order to express uh, uh, the other protein? I mean, through degrading the protein that are already there, through some medium that maybe it's uh, still around, or? So, um we don't expect that there is medium still around because the switch is very, very quick. And actually, the, sort of the, the fact that the cells enter growth area so quickly is showing us that we replace the media very quickly. So I would rather bet on something like, yes, uh, a bit of recycling of internal components, although this is limited by the protein degradation. And also, potentially, some uh, reserves in the literature. There are sort of some reports of uh, glycerol stocks that are very short lasting and st stuff like that. So um, I would expect the internal pool of the, of the cell to play this role, but we actually don't know. So in your experiments, you shift very quickly right to the carbon-free medium? Yes. So how much of uh, this very quick response 
determines this uh, initial condition dependency in some sense. So if you were to shift it more slowly, I guess you would see less of this uh, uh, effect, yeah. So we also conducted these experiments by using batch cultures, where the, we flow a batch culture through the chip, and the cells are sort of then growing in these limited nutrients and enter progressively stationary right. phase. Mm -hmm. And so the cell in the chip are experiencing the same sort of progressive change of media. Mm -hmm. And we see a remarkably similar uh, pattern in terms of gene expression. Uh, so it's actually, I, I think it would be interesting to push it um, in uh, even slower growth and so on. But for a standard like starvation, mm -hmm. uh, stationary phase entry, we actually observe the same uh, thing. Okay, thank you. What is the mechanism of very rapid activation of RPOS? Uh, is there an anti-sigma factor for this sigma factor? So how, how can it, you know, again, I know that the sigma factors are usually uh, sequestered with anti-sigma factors, and the purpose of this is to do everything much faster than you would do if you just relied on transcriptional regulation. So what is, what is going on here? So the main, uh, the main up regulation is linked to the fact that LPOS is uh, during exponential phase constantly degraded and this degradation stops when the ATP gets depleted. So the pool of LPOS is actually um, piling up. On top of that, you have a tiny bit of transcriptional up regulation and you have the activity of a protein called CRL that will actually sort of um, help RPOS to uh, win the um, competition for the RNA uh, polymerase, the core RNA polymerase versus sigma 70. So you have like a couple of uh, different um, mechanisms that are actually pushing RPOS activity to uh, shoot up very quickly. And I, but the main one is really like that you stop degrading it and so suddenly sort of the constant expression is getting bigger. Okay, and a related question again, or maybe not so related. So um, <laughs> here, <laughs> maybe maybe not, uh, but uh, I, I kind of got confused. So here yeah. in the left panel, you see virtually no degradation, so everything stays roughly constant. Mm -hmm. And in the previous few slides, you were showing that you measured uh, rapid degradation. So what, what is the difference between? So what the, I've seen, what I've shown in the previous slide is sort of basically, uh, mm, this is not working, I guess, is that like the production activity is dropping, right? Yeah. And so that's why here you don't replace um, the pool of protein, whereas here you sort of like your protein production keeps on lingering on for a while, and that's why you start reshuffling the, um, uh, the well, you start replacing, well, basically adding up some protein and sort of diluting the, the other one out, basically. Right, so you replace what you produce, but uh, you degrade what you produce and you don't degrade what you don't produce. But in a couple of slides ago, you had uh, something which I interpreted the overall proteome-wide degradation, but maybe I was wrong. So... Um, yeah, something like, well, I, there was some experimental data. You said that so, you measured it. So like uh, we, what we measure is the um, degradation of, the, of our fluorescent protein, and this is what drives RPLN concentration here to, uh, to, so to go down uh, on the left. And this is an effect that also um, touches on HSLV and BOLA, but because those are producing more than they degrade, you see the concentration increasing. But in the case of RPLN, because the production drops uh, very sharply, the degradation is actually contributing to reduce its concentration. I see, I see. Yes, so does that matter at all? And what we can do is test that by submitting the cells to an oxidative stress uh, and asking, okay, now if we start perturbing the um, uh, gene expression uh, in various ways, how does this affect the relevant trait that we're interested in here, tolerance to oxidative stress. So the first condition we use is not perturbing anything at all. Uh, we simply switch the cells from M9 glucose where they grow exponentially to starvation, just as I did uh, up till now, and then submit the cells after 20 hours of starvation to five hours of oxidative stress and switch them back to fresh media in order to ask what fraction of the cell is able to regrow after those five hours of oxidative stress. And this is a measure of viability, how many cells are able to regrow within 20 hours uh, in M9 glucose. Um, when we do that and we follow the, our BOLA reporter, as previously shown, we observe the concentration is ramping up very quickly uh, and is uh, relatively stable until the point where we hit them with the stress. 
And we ask, when we ask, okay, what fraction of the cell are able to uh, regrow after the oxidative stress, we see the fraction of surviving is almost 100% in our cases. So like we use a rather mild uh, oxidative stress when the cells are left to express gene as um, uh, normally. Now the second condition we can use now is, okay, if we uh, kill uh, our POS, we expect that actually the starvation and stress response will be killed as well because this is the main sigma factor implicated in this. So this kind of like the extreme where we prevent the cells from having this stress and starvation uh, response and, um, and we can submit them to the same treatment. When we follow the concentration of our reporter, we see that as expected, it remains extremely low during the entirety of the starvation. And now if we ask what fraction of the cell is able to regrow, we see that almost none uh, is able to survive this oxidative stress. So this really highlights the fact that RPOS, as was reported before, is fundamental in this process. And uh, we believe that part of this uh, uh, is due to the fact that it uh, allows cells to kick up some genes uh, during starvation. But if you pay attention, you'll see that during exponential growth, there is already a much lower level of the concentration, or like a lower level of the concentration of, uh, of the reporter. So this means that the RPS knockout strain uh, are not able to upregulate upon the entry into starvation, but they also start with a lower level. So probably this response that we observe is a combination of uh, not being able to increase the level, but also starting with a lower level. And what we're really interested in is what would happen if we um, simply prevent the cells from expressing during starvation. So we use chloramphenicol in order to um, inhibit gene expression only during starvation. So we let the cells express normally during their exponential growth. And as we switch them to starvation, we also put them into chloramphenicol that is expected to reduce their ability to express genes. Following our fluorescent reporter, here we see that we don't get a complete inhibition, but we still decrease substantially the level of expression of, uh, of this reporter. So this shows that this chloramphenicol condition is not killing gene expression entirely, but is dramatically reducing it. Now, if we ask what fraction of the cells are able to regrow, we see that we about get about 20%. So it means that compared to the situation without perturbation, preventing the cells from expressing their gene normally during uh, uh, starvation, is decreasing 80% their ability to survive uh, an oxidative stress that is concurrent with starvation. So this shows that like, expressing gene is important during starvation for a relevant train. But my main point was to say that actually what matters really to set the phenotype is the early um, production events. So now we can ask, okay, now if we let the cell express normally during the first five hours of starvation, would this change anything? We would expect, from what I explained earlier, that it would actually allow the cells to recover quite a bit of their uh, viability because they would be able to set their phenotype uh, early on and then expressing or not expressing wouldn't make such a big difference. What we see is that uh, the concentration of our fluorescent reporter is uh, indistinguishable from um, the concentration without perturbation, which it was expected because we've seen that most of the dynamic in terms of gene expression was happening early on. And now looking at the fraction of the cell that is able to survive, we see that we recover an extra 50% of viability compared to uh, inhibiting gene expression during the entirety of starvation. So this really shows that Having early gene expression, being allowed to express only during five hours is already allowing to recover like 70% compared to, um, to the RPS knockout. So this really tells us that this early gene expression, as we were hypothesizing before, is fundamental to set the uh, state of the cell, and then the cells will keep this state for a very long time during starvation. And so it's fundamentally different from the exponentially growing case where we can look at the cell, check how much it expresses, or what is the concentration of the protein at the time t, and because of the fast turnover, we get an information about the gene expression status, and like it's not really required to know the full history of the cell in steady state exponential growth to understand its current state. In stationary phase, we think that it's really fundamental and everything is played very early on. All the action is happening early on, and then the cells are frozen in this state, and they have to deal with whatever comes with what they were able to do early on. So I will summarize with this. Um, I showed that the delay between production arrest and growth arrest is resulting in a rapid um, reorganization of the protein across single, a single E. coli cell. I've then showed that the phenotype is then set early on in starvation and is kept for a very long time, 
and that this early expression is critical for relevant phenotypes such as the survival to concurrent stress. With this, I would like to thank the Van den Wegen group and especially the people that have been directly implicated uh, on this project. And I would also like to thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take uh, any question. Thanks a lot. Uh, we have time for a couple of uh, questions. So maybe I missed it, but um, so you measure degradation rates. So do you observe any um, uh, specific uh, time course of degradation uh, from the exponential phase to the shift uh, until long-term uh, observation? So we are not able to measure it uh, with our method in, uh, in exponential phase. Okay. Um, so like the way I was doing it, but we, it also matters much less because the dilution mm -hmm. uh, rate will set the rate of the turnover of the protein. Mm -hmm. But because we are uh, relying on the fact of being able to sort of shine light once and then uh, 10 hours later on the cell and measure the level of protein, mm -hmm. we wouldn't be able to do that on exponentially growing cells because obviously um, this is not the same cell that we can observe across time. Okay. So uh, in the way I'm doing it, I'm just assuming that the uh, starting level in starvation is the level of degradation in uh, exponential phase, mm -hmm. but it's anyway a negligible effect compared to the dilution rate. Sure, sure. So, but so, so you, you wouldn't be able to tell whether cells increase their degradation rates uh, from exponential phase to whether they activate it more. No, that, like that. that we are not able to tell. Okay, okay. Um. Yes, we have time for. So uh, the, the transition into starvation phase, the processes that are happening to the protein, do you think it's a program that once it's triggered, it will just run until the end? Or do you think it, it, would, uh, it would be stopped and adapted when, in, in that very moment, um, nutrients become available? So I think that the uh, RPOS activity is, uh, is a program response, but I think part of it is also coming from the dilution rate that stops, right? And if you would put them back into fresh nutrient, I expect like in the middle of this uh, transition phase, mm -hmm. I actually expect that they would start regrow uh, quickly and that all the sort of processes that are responsible of like, well, basically you start returning over your protein very quickly and your phenotype is able to recover uh, very fast. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, if we let the cell long enough in starvation, then you see a, a very long lag phase uh, before they start regrowing and the duration of the lag phase has been reported to be a function of the duration of the starvation. But if you let the cell in one hour during carbon starvation and you switch them back to glucose, they are able to regrow without a lag, basically. Right. So maybe there could be some kind of feed-forward loop trigger, like making this, this asymmetric um, process, like that switching on and off are, are different. Yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah. So my, my question is exactly about this lag which you mentioned in answer in the previous question. So do you have any intuition of what sets the duration of it? Because here is where I'm confused. So the main message of your talk is that first five hours or maybe 10 hours are critical and then nothing changes after this. And that means that there should be no duration or no, no influence on duration on the lag if you stay 20 hours or 30 hours or whatever. Yet, you just said that the duration of the stationary phase is very uh, variable. So just tell me what, it, what is, how do you understand this lag on re-entry to the exponential growth? So it's a fair point. I th what I'm um, mostly focusing on here is sort of the phenotype that is relevant for starvation. But of course, like the, as you mentioned, right, and uh, like the longer we let them in starvation and the more they will struggle to get the right phenotype when they have to regrow. Right? Um, I think this could be due to several things. Like you have this uh, ribosome uh, hibernation uh, system that starts be, um, uh, coming in. And also, we also know that if we let the cells long enough in starvation, they will eventually start dying. They cannot sustain this state for a very long time. So it could be that they accumulate some damages um, and that uh, they have like, an accumulation of misfolded protein and, and components that are toxic for the cell. And then they, get sort of, they have to get rid of that and put things in, on their feet again before being able to regrow. So this is sort of, uh, I would say, 
This is sort of an aimed phenotype in the sense like it feels like the cells start kicking in, also lots of responses, osmotic stress and so on that they might not primarily need in starvation, but where they wouldn't have the time to adapt in case these kind of stresses would come later on. So some kind of preventive response, if you wish. Uh, and another aspect is the thing that are going to degrade anyway, because uh, in the absence of energy, the cells are not able to sustain uh, for a very long time. Okay. You, okay, so we have one last question. So I was wondering, you showed the, um, um, for three different promoters kind of the dynamics, and, I was one, and now then, in the end, if I understood correctly, I mean, you showed the knockout, the behavior for the knockout of RPOS, which I guess is not su uh, surprising, and then the inhibition of, yeah, most, um, how would you say, of most processes. So I was wondering, did you take any more take do you can comment anything on take home messages from the different promoters that you studied so it looks like um, if we see which promoters are upregulated and which are downregulated typically our ribosomal promoters are following the trend that I showed for the ribosomal promoters they sharply go down and so sort of this is is also look like an active process an active sort of uh, downregulation this is in general true for the promoters that we would associate with sort of uh, exponential growth, whatever it means, but like fast growth, such as ribosomes and so on. It feels like this is an active process of saying we don't want that. Um, also, what I find interesting in the case of the ribosomal promoter is that they usually consume a lot of resources. It's like uh, very costly to express ribosome. And so down regulating those very quickly is actually also allowing the cells to use the pool of resources that remains to express a lot of other things. And because the dilution stop, with this limited pool of resources, they're still able to do a lot somehow. So that is my vision of the way uh, these, uh, prom why these promoters are getting downregulated. Then I think the very important promoters, such as BOLA and the ones that are RPS regulated, they get kicked up very high so that they get a very high expression. And you also have some promoters like this HSLV that is sort of simply petering out, but even this decreasing activity is enough to increase the concentration um, and to understand really what sets exactly sort of the level of the peak and sort of the time dynamic of this, um, of this decrease of, of production activity is, uh, is not clear yet. But uh, yeah, that would be definitely an interesting question to answer. Okay, let's thank the speaker again. Okay, so we move... Uh upstairs for uh, coffee and I said